Hi, and welcome to Family Church's YouTube channel. We hope you enjoyed today's message from Pastor Matthew Whalen in week four of our series, The Good News. Well, praise God. Thank you, Pastor Matt. Such an honor and a privilege to be here. Welcome, Family Church. So glad you guys are joining in. Um, just really honored and, and privileged to be here speaking to you guys this morning. Again, I'd like to thank Pastor Matt, but also I'd really like to thank the staff of Family Church, as well as all of our members or those who may not be members but are visiting with us online. We really want to welcome you and just say Happy Father's Day. Thank you guys for tuning in. Thank you guys for being so faithful. Thank you guys for being so understanding. And thank you guys for being so diligent to continue to press in to the things of God and to continue to seek Him Seek His face, seek His will, and seek His word during these times. It's one of those things where a personal relationship with God is just that. It's not about the house, it's about the heart. And we are so glad that many of you have continued to worship with us as a family. And today on Father's Day, I couldn't be more honored than to bring a message to you. But it's much more than a message. It's just maybe something that you haven't heard in a while. And that is that God loves you. I know we've been preaching the gospel and we've probably been saying it. We've been repeating that. What is the gospel? The gospel is the good news. And in the heart and the essence of what the good news at its very basis form is that God loves you. Sometimes we get caught up in Christian life, the doing, the moving, the work, and all these other things to where we start to forget and we start to lose sight of the fact that our Heavenly Father loves us. And today on Father's Day, I really just want to encourage fathers that an example has been set by your Heavenly Father that with the Holy Spirit and with His Word and with encouragement from each other, that's why we are a family, we can be the fathers that God has called us to be. And it's one of those things on Father's Day where, you know, Mothers get flowers and they get all these other things. And I've heard tons of Mother's Day messages where people are so appreciative for mamas. And we really love our mamas. And then Father's Day comes and it's like, I'm going to drop the hammer and you better do your job. And it's kind of like, well, thanks. Mother's got a great message and I came in and I got told I better do my job. Well, that's just part of our responsibility. It's part of how God laid it out. Because the father and the mother are one. You're one unit. So it's one of those things, but the additional thing is you are the head of the household. And for those of you who may be watching today, who may not have a father, or who may be a single parent, just know that the scripture says when your mother, mother and father forsake you, your heavenly father is there. And know that when you have a family and a body of believers that you've been planted in, there are father figures there. There are people there to offer that support, to offer that comfort, to offer that guidance. And all you have to do is continue to press in to what God has called you to do. So as we get started, I just want to read a couple things, a um, couple stereotypes, and I'll really preface it by saying that, that will probably apply to a lot of us men, and then we'll get into our message. But um, four things that can you can only get away with on Father's Day. So you can get away with these four things today because number one, your wife should be watching with you and you can say, look, the pastor said I can get away with this. So pastor is saying this, you can blame it on me. But you can't get away with these any other day of the year. Number one, when a wife says whatever possible phrase, whatever you have to say, during, oh, you can tell your wife, whenever possible, please say what you have to say only during commercials. Number two, Whenever we ask a question, you don't have to give us the whole story. Yes and no are perfectly acceptable today. Wives, if your husband says, please check the oil in your car at least once in a while, you should say, yes, dear, but only today. And then the fourth thing is, we know exactly where we are. Therefore, you never have to bring up the phrase, do you need to stop for directions? Like I said, again, those are only in use for today, so you have about 10 more hours to use those. 10 things that separate a father from a mother, just in natural life, is, I just said it, a man never needs to ask for directions. He will eventually find his way there, and when you're not looking, he'll use Google Maps. Number nine, the good thing about being a father is I can go to the bathroom without a support group, and I don't need to tell anybody I'm going to the bathroom. I can just go to the bathroom. 
Another good thing is if one of my friends forgets to invite me to something that they're throwing, they're still my friend. And I'm actually thankful that they didn't invite me because I probably didn't really want to go anyway. I wanted to spend the afternoon at home. You can drop by and see a friend without bringing a gift. If another guy shows up to a party wearing the exact same shirt as you, guess what? You don't try and stay away from them, you stay as close to them as possible because eventually it's a potential new best friend. One wallet, one pair of shoes, one color for all seasons and I completely disagree with that even though today I'm not wearing a suit. If you've ever seen me on a Sunday, I have several belts, several shoes and yes I do have several wallets so I will debunk that lie and if you've ever seen Pastor Matt, he is one of the most fashionable people I know and uh, he does a great job at that. But I'm sure his wife Caitlin has a hand in all of that because I know when I get dressed, my wife, sometimes when I walk out in a suit, she'll say that tie, which means to me, this is not the tie. So, and this is different in the C19 area, but it is proven to be true. There is always a game on TV somewhere. Now you might say that's not true. I beg to differ. I have watched more Korean League baseball in the last two weeks than I ever thought I would in my whole life and I can now say the phrase Bundesliga, which if you don't know, it's football, but not American football, soccer, Bundesliga. Never thought I would watch that, but there is always a game on somewhere. And your pals can, never, can be trusted to never trap you with the phrase so, you notice anything different about me? Last two. If something me mechanical doesn't work, men can always fix it by bashing it with a hammer, slamming it against the wall, or just throwing it in a drawer and saying, I'm going to get a new one. And the last one that separates most men from their wives, and I'll say this, we can do our nails without going to a nail salon, and we can either use a pocket knife or our teeth. So if that applies to you, happy Father's Day. But all joking aside, when you think about the gospel, which is the message we're in, the true essence of the gospel is summed up in a scripture. And it's John 3.16. And so many times we say, yes, I've heard that. Oh, John 3.16. And when it comes to the Word of God, that should never be an attitude we take. Because at any moment, you can get new revelation and new understanding from a scripture. And John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him can have eternal life. He so loved us that He sent His Son. The greatest example and expression of God's love started with God. And a lot of times we think about, yeah, the New Testament, but no, the greatest example of love started way back in the garden with Adam. God loved him so much that he created him. And then all throughout the Old Testament, God continues to show his love for his creation, for his children by continuing to bring them along and he set a plan in place. Once Adam fell, God loved him so much that he put a plan in place so that we could be reconciled to God and that is the true gospel and that is the true heart of a father. The true heart of a father is whatever you do, you do it to benefit your child. See, a child doesn't ask to be brought into this world. Parents, you know, somebody didn't call you one night and say, hey, you know, I'd like to be born so maybe you guys can um, go through the process and have me. No, that didn't happen. Adam didn't ask to be created. See, a father creates a child for the benefit of the child. And one of the important things and one of the most interesting things is when people go through an adoption process, one of the main questions and things that they look at is, why are you doing this? And one of the things that can, propose, can pose a red flag is if when they respond to those questions, if a lot of the reason why they're wanting to adopt a child is for the parent's benefit, it raises a red flag because parents should never want children just for their benefit. The benefit of a parent is for the benefit of the child. When God created Adam, from that point on, everything he did was to benefit his creation. And when his creation fell, 
He turned and said, now I have to have a plan to reconcile that. And that plan is Jesus Christ. And it's coming. And everything from that point forward was a father guiding and leading his creation to reconciliation on the cross. And that's what true love is. And that's the gospel. That is John 3.16. That the person that created you loves you so much, no matter how you messed up, he's going to do everything he can to bring you back to reconciliation. And that's the true heart of a father. And that's the heart that us as fathers have to have. And we have to be the men of God that say, you know what? Our kids may not be perfect. Our marriage may not be perfect. But whatever I'm going to do, everything I do from this point is to reconcile everything and point everything back to the father. In 1 John 4, 19, it says, we love him because he first loved us. He loved us. It says in Romans 2, 4, it says, don't you know it's the love of God that leads men to repentance. It's when you understand that the person who created you has done everything in his power to reconcile you to him so that the Father and the Son can have relationship again. That's the true heart of a father. That's Father's Day. That's the good news. The good news is that you have somebody who loves you so much. He's not going to stop trying to get you reconciled to him until you leave this earth. And on top of that, once you have accepted him, he's going to do everything he can to try and get you to fulfill his will in your life. He gave us his word. He gave us his Holy Spirit. And he wants everything to be the benefit of you. And, and, and the, the rub of that is, is sometimes we look at our Heavenly Father and we use the example of our earthly father. And, and there's two sides to this. It should encourage you men to be godly fathers. Not perfect, but godly. Because what that'll do is it'll show your kids, man, if my daddy loves me and treats me like this, how much more does my heavenly daddy? But on the flip side, there's some of us who maybe didn't have a godly example. And we've come to Christ. And we see God through the lens of the father that we had or we didn't have. And so we think maybe God's just up there waiting to, to yell at me. Maybe God's really not there because my father wasn't there. And God is saying, no, you can't use that example. You've got to use the example that I put in the word for you. And you've got to let my Holy Spirit guide you and lead you. See, the ultimate example of love is not just letting somebody do what they want. Love corrects, love disciplines, love guides, because love ultimately knows I'm going to do everything I can to set you up to succeed in life, to let you succeed in the world so I can see you in my kingdom. True fatherhood is doing what is best for the child, regardless, regardless of the cost to the father. See, true fatherhood is doing what is best for your children, regardless of the cost to the Father. How can I say that? Because it cost God everything. It cost Him His Son to reconcile us to Him. And you may say, well, you know, I don't feel like He loves me. Well, I hate to say this to you, but it's not about your feelings. Sometimes when you discipline your children out of them just being disobedient, you're disciplining out of love. To them, they're like, well, I don't feel like Dad loves me. He put me in time out. Or He gave me some of these. Some nalgasos, spankings. But you're doing it because you're correcting your child because you love them. And if you do it out of love, love is reciprocated back to you. And yes, there are benefits of being a parent. You know, when that child looks up at you, I remember uh, Pastor Matt, when he first uh, started having kids, I used to love to stand in the lobby when they would get here because when those children would see him and run up to him, that's ultimate joy. That's the ultimate joy to have your child run up and just grab you and hug you. Well, the same thing goes for your father. And then we've had Madison, and she does that to me, and it's like, that's great. And th in those moments, it helps you forget all the imperfect moments. And it makes you as a father want to do better and be the person of God to be that example. We can't base God's love on our feelings. Because our feelings will always change. 
You have to base and understand how much God loves you by one, re by one fact and one fact alone. And that's the action that has been taken since the time he created man and man sinned. And that action that he took was to reconcile you to him because he wants you back. And the biggest example of that was he sent his son. It's not about a feeling, it's about an action. And that action was Jesus Christ. His love is unconditional. His love can always be measured by that one action that he gave his son to love us. And that is the gospel from a father's perspective. It's not about being spoiled, feeling God's wrath. It's about you understanding that everything he has for you and everything he does for you is not only to benefit you, but to benefit his kingdom and so that you can have an eternal life with him. Ephesians 3, 18, 21 says this, and I'll read it, and um, we'll get started here in a minute. This is still, I think, my intro, so praise God. <laughs> um, Ephesians 3.18 says this. It says, I'll start at 17. It says that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love, it's talking about God's love, being rooted and grounded in love, Verse 18, may be able to comprehend with all the saints, all the saints, those here and those in heaven, that you may be able to comprehend with all the saints the width, the length, the depth, and the heights to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge and all understanding, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. And to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. To him be the glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever. Amen. It's an amazing scripture. Because it's Paul trying to put something into words that is almost indescribable. He's saying, I can't really describe to you what the love of God is. And you can't really understand it unless you have the Holy Spirit on the inside of you to reveal that love to you, to give you the revelation knowledge of the depth. So he's using words. He's saying, I, I, it's, I'm trying to describe something that words can't describe. So the depth, the heights, the length, all these things, are, I'm trying to get you to understand the love of Christ. And you can't understand it on your own. You have to have the Holy Spirit to help reveal it to you. That's the love our Father has for us. It's having to use the Holy Spirit to really grasp, apprehend, and understand the love of God. Because you start to understand how much God loves you. You start to really want to live for Him and not disappoint Him. It's not perfect, but it's putting you on that path to say, you know what, I understand how my Father loves me. And let me tell you, if a husband or a father understands the love of God, it's easy for him to pass it on to his wife and his children. Because it's not about words, it's about actions. Going back to when I said it's not about an emotion, it's about the action behind it. How many of us have heard the saying, you know, talk is cheap, action is profitable. Don't tell me you love me. Show me you love me. Because that's what Jesus did. That's what God, your heavenly father, did. And on this Father's Day, all I want to do is remind you about the gospel, the good news that your Father loves you. And He wants you to love the people He's entrusted to you the same way. And it's a process. It's a growing process. But He wants you to take that step and go down that path with Him. It reminds me of a, an old hymn um, describing it. And I've probably only heard this hymn a couple times. And I heard it back when I first got saved. And it just, it captures the essence of God and it captures the essence of that scripture and it's just been rolling around in my, my heart all day. And there are peri periodically throughout some times where I'm going through a difficult situation where I don't feel loved, where I feel like God is far away. This song comes back to me and it reminds me of this scripture. And um, I can't sing. I can sing. I can make a joyful noise. But... Um, I think if you have any dogs in your living room, you might want to send them to another room. But um, I just want to share the words of this song. 
You can just close your eyes or you can just listen. But it's a song that just resonates in me all the time because it's His Word. And it's something that no matter how much or what I'm going through, it just really ministers to me. <clears throat> and I'll say this is a first. I've been in ministry almost 18, 19 years, and I've never sung. But technically, I'm not going to sing. I'm just going to share these words. It's an old hymn. Don't know who wrote it. I've only heard it a few times, but the words go like this. I want to know the height, the breadth, the length, and the depth. Of the love who gave himself for me. I want to know the height, the breadth, the length, and the depth of the love who gave himself for me. Well, God loves me. My Father loves me. Oh, how God loves me. My Father loves me. Oh, God loves me. My Father loves me. I want to know the height, the breadth, the length, and the depth of the love who gave himself for me. I want to know the height, the breadth, the length, and the depth of the love who gave himself for me. Well, God loves me. My Father loves me. God loves me. My Father loves me. Oh, God loves me. My Father loves me. Father, we thank you. We thank you that you initiated this relationship by creating us. And we thank you that you've done everything you can possibly do by sending your son to reconcile us to you. You put a plan in motion when we failed because you love us you forgave us. You sanctified us. You've made us whole. You've given us your word. You've given us your spirit. And you've given us everything that we need to continue on this path. To be the men, the fathers, the mothers, the children of God. Your children, Father. And I thank you, Lord, that today on this Father's Day, Father's Day, as we preach about the gospel, that we understand that the gospel is all about you. It's all about the love of a father, it's reconciling his creation back to him and doing everything in his power so that we could spend eternity with you, Father, so that we can feel the love of Christ, so that we can sense the love of God, so that we can have the love of God which surpasses all understanding, Father. And you've done all that because you love us. And we understand that although it may not feel good all the times, the correction, the discipline, we know it's out of the love of a Father's heart that you do these things. And we thank you for that. And today, Father, we know that God loves us. And that is the gospel, the good news. And Father, I thank you for this message, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that you continue to guide us. And for those fathers who may be downtrodden and may be feeling beaten up or may be feeling they're not the father they should be, that through your word, Father, they know there is hope 
there's guidance and there's a way to become the men and fathers of God that we've been called to be. And I thank you, Father, that through your scripture and through your word, you'll give revelation knowledge to each and every one of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, praise God. Um, so we're going to be in Ephesians 5 today. 525, we'll start there. And I'm going to point out some things um, about a father. And I said at the beginning that sometimes it's not doesn't seem fair because the father is really the, the head of the household. And um, I grew up around somebody who, and I've seen a lot of fathers who always use this phrase, you know, do as I say, but not as I do. Right? Hey, uh, and you know, uh, um, I've seen fathers that smoke cigarettes and tell their kid, I better not ever see you doing this. Well, guess what? Most of those kids grow up and smoke. Because when it comes to children, no matter what you say, they do what they see their parents do. They do what they see their father do. And it goes back to that scripture where Jesus says, I only do what I see the father do. I only say what I hear my father say. And from that perspective, you can take that scripture from a parent and say, you know what, that's true in all essence. You know, I have a two-year-old now, and it's funny, I'll, I'll say something to her ten times. Do, you know, say this word, say this word, say this word, say this word, and she won't say it. It's like she can't understand it. And all of a sudden, I'll say something like, I think I said stupid the other day. And it's like, stupid? And I'm like, seriously? Like, I just said that once, and now you got it. All these other words I'm trying to teach you with flashcards, you don't want to say them. Which leads me to, to understand that I think she knows she's just doing it on purpose. She started doing this to me, which I hadn't done in years, which is kind of weird. Because it has to be something in her DNA. Because I used to do it to my wife a lot before we had kids. My wife would say something to me, and I'd go, huh? And so she'd say it again. And I'd go, huh? 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 And about the fourth time, I'd be like, you know what I'm saying. My little girl has started to do that. And I haven't done that in years. So I'll start talking to her, and I'm like, Madison, you know, we can't do that, sweetie. Huh? I'm like, sweetie. Huh? Huh? And so I've got to the point where I'm like, you know what I'm saying. And she'll laugh. And so it's one of those things where your kids get so much from you, you don't even realize it. There was a study that was done, and it says uh, when it comes to kids in church, if a, kid goes, if a mom goes to church but the dad doesn't go to church, 37% of the time after that as they grow up, a child will attend. So if you have a parent, a two-household parent, and the mom goes but the dad doesn't go, about 37% of the time, the children will attend church later on in life. If you have a, a family where the dad and mom go to church regularly, their children will 78% of the time go to church. Or if you have, but the incredible fact here is that if you have a dad, but not a mom who goes to church, so if the dad goes and the mom doesn't with the kids, 84% of the time, the kids will continue going on to church. Can you see that discrepancy between mom and dad? If it's a mom without the dad and the dad stays home, 37%. If it's a mom and a dad, 74%. But if it's just dad, it goes higher. That just goes to show the influence and the power that a father has on a child. I, I remember hearing a story of a, a young de a father. He's on his recliner and watching football is about to start. And he said, hey, boy. You better hurry up and get ready to go to church. Your mom's going to be waiting for you. All right, Dad, are you going to church? Oh, no, I'm not going to church. The little kid says, well, how come I have to go to church? He says, because you need to go with your mother. He says, well, Dad, did you used to, uh, did you used to go, go to church when you were a little boy? And the dad sat up proudly in his recliner and looked over and said, Son, absolutely I did. I always went to church when I was a little boy, just like you're going to do. And the little boy says, all right, I guess I'll go. But I guess when I get old, it won't do me any good either. Our kids watch us. Dads. Ephesians 5, 25. We're going to go quick. Ephesians 5, 25. We'll start there. 
Um, well, we'll start in 24. Ephesians 5, 24. It says, Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, verse 25, Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church, and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. Washing with the word, that's a great scripture. Verse 27, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that, the, but that she should be holy and without blemish. Verse 28, so husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, his flesh, and of his bones. Verse 31, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother, and will be joined with his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Verse 38, Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she is respects her husband. Verse, And I'll just go a couple verses down. Chapter 6, um, Verse 2, it says, And children, honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. And it's interesting, we're on Father's Day, that he speaks about a husband loving his wife. Because I'll tell you this, if a husband can love his wife the same way Christ loves the church, guess what? The love will trickle down to the children. It's very hard to say, I love my children, but I hate my wife. Very hard. And that's why the scripture is laid out that way. It's saying you have to respect and love each other. And within that, and within these things we started talking about, about Jesus, there are five types of, of love that I see in the scripture. And they all based on one thing, and that's the agape love of God. There are several types of love, eros, strogis, strogis, I can't speak Greek, but agape love is the God kind of love. And every one of these things that are brought out in this form of scripture are all centered on the agape love, the love of God, your father, that he's extended to you as a child, that he wants you to extend to your wife, which in turn trickle down to your children and cause you to be a godly father. Not a perfect father, but a God a father after God's own heart. And when it comes to be a father, the first thing they talk about here is there's five pillars. In a, in a time when society is saying, if it gets hard, just leave. You don't need him. She doesn't need you. We can live separate lives. God is saying, no, you have to have the foundation of God's love in your heart and in your wife's heart, because if you two are one, as it was intended to be, it's easier. I won't say it's easy, because children are children. You know, I've said this before from this stage, and I don't know, you know, children are born with their brain in their, their bottom, and you got 18 years to knock that thing up to their head. Just kidding, we don't hit our kids. Timeouts, timeouts, that's the, the new thing. But you have 18 years as a couple to show the love of Christ and to teach them the agape love and to show them all those things. So the first type of love that they talk about here in verse 25 is a sacrificial love. He says, love your wife as Christ loved the church. Well, what did Christ do? He sacrificed it all for you. That's sacrifice. It's not about selfishness. It's about sacrifice. Being sacrificial, sacrificial means be ready to give. That's the first thing that's expressed in here. You have to be ready to give as a father. Give your time, your money, your emotions. Give out of everything so that you can sacrifice for your child. And if you have young children, you know that that starts on a Saturday morning at 6 in the morning. I told Pastor Matt earlier, I said, I don't get it. Monday through Friday, when our daughter goes to, to, with her grandmother for daycare while we go to work, we can't get her out of bed at 7. She's like, she just lays there and we're like, Madison, get up. You got to go to your nana's. Madison, get up. So we're thinking, all right, tomorrow, Saturday, she's been sleeping until 7, 7.30. She's going to sleep in tomorrow. 5.30, she's up and at it. It's like, how do you even know that, that we're here today? How do you know today's the day? Well, it's sacrifice. And you sacrifice in the little things, it becomes easier to sacrifice in the big things. And I've known a lot of great fathers. I've known a lot of not-so-good fathers. I've known a lot of bad fathers. And I've always said you can always learn either what to do or what not to do. And some of the greatest fathers are some of the greatest givers. They sacrifice. 
They do things when they don't feel like they want to do it. Because they do what God did. He sacrificed it all to reconcile. And so that we could have a better future. The second type of love in verse 26 is a purifying type of love. And like I said, these are all rooted in agape. These are all God types. This is all out of the God type of love. But these are characteristics. They're sacrificial. Verse 25. Number two, verse 26, they're purifying. That he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of the water by the word. It's purifying. It's being the head of your household, washing your family with the Word of God, and being that example of who Christ is in your life. The love that Jesus has for us is a purifying love. When you accept Him in your heart, you're forgiven. And as you mess up, there are more forgiveness. There's more forgiveness of sins. It's not an excuse to mess up or to do what you want, but it's a purifying love that says, hey, we want you to be better. It's, one of the, it's the type of love when you come into a message, like you come into a sermon, and God's word is being preached, and even though it's telling you where you need to be better, where you need to change, where you need to improve, you get that, and you understand that it's coming from a loving heart, and you're like, yes, and you walk out of these doors, and you say, yes, I want to be more like Jesus. I want to be more the God and the Father that God has called me to be and it helps encourage you to propel you forward just like you do with your kids when you tell them no that's not a good place to go no that's not a good friend to be around no I've been down those paths you're not doing it to control you're doing it out of love and you're telling them these things so that you can help propel them forward let me give you a principle about purifying love anytime you tear down your wife or your kids with cutting remarks, mean words, rudeness. That's not purifying. Purifying is lifting them up so that the words that you speak are life and it makes them want to do the right thing. It makes them want to change and it makes them understand that even though they messed up, guess what? What you're telling me is out of a loving heart and I want to do that. The hallmark of lifting and encouraging words is always change. You can't yell or scream somebody into change. And I know I made the joke about you have this so much time to put the brain up to the head. You can't beat rebellion out of a kid. But you can be an example and you can minister and you can, can give that example so at the end of the day you can say, I did everything that I was supposed to do from the word. The decision is going to be theirs. The third type is a caring love. Verse 27. It says that he might present her to himself a glorious church. And he's talking about Jesus presenting the church to him. Not having a spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she should be holy and without blemish. It's a caring type of love. He cares for us so much. Jesus' first act of caring for the church was to die for us because that's how much he cares. And when it comes to a caring type of love, fathers, there's three things that go with, it, with that caring type of love. You have to be caring physically. You have to be physically caring for that person. Work, support, be there, help, clean the house, clean the yard, clean the garage, take the trash out. That's all physical. And it seems so superficial, but you have to be that. No matter how much you don't want to throw the trash, no matter how much you don't want to pull weeds, it goes back to sacrifice, but it's a caring. You're doing these things because you care about your household. There is a physical aspect to it. I'm going to give you food. I'm going to give you shelter. I'm going to give you physical needs. If that is... Laying 15 tons of rock in the backyard on a Saturday when you've worked all week in the hot sun while your daughter plays on the grass. We've all been there. There are physical things that fathers have to do. With that loving care, there's also emotional care. You have to care for her. You have to love her. You have to listen. And I know that's the hardest thing for a man because we're not listeners, we're solvers. Let me tell you how my day went. Oh, got half the story. Already got the answer. Don't need, I can already tell you what to do. Don't need to hear the rest. I got, I got it. Let me tell you how to fix that. 
Sometimes they don't want us to fix it, they just want us to listen, and that's an emotional care, and that's a difference between men and women. That's just one of those differences. Um, I look at it this way, if my wife tells me, hey, I wanna go buy a dress at the mall or anything like that, I look at it as good. I'm not going, she's like, let's go shopping. I'm, I'm not going shopping. I'm going to hunt, seek, find, and devour a dress and bring it home. I'm not shopping. That's kind of the difference. We have to listen. You have to have emotional care. You have to pay attention. Too many times, married couples, conversations go something like this. You're lying in bed, and your wife says to you, I had a terrible day at work. And you say, then just quit. Your wife says, I don't want to quit. I was just trying to tell you I had a bad day. Husband says, well, if you don't want my opinion, why'd you ask for it? Wife says, just forget it. Just forget I said anything. Husband says, I will. Don't emotionally turn each other off. You gotta listen to each other. You gotta talk to each other emotionally. You gotta be there for each other. Physical, emotional, and spiritually. I'll say it again. Fathers, we're the head of the household. It's just how it is. You have to cherish the Word of God. You have to continue to do those things and be the man of God and guide your family for them. Your wife is there to be your helpmate. Think about it from, from this perspective. I said you got to be physically there, emotionally there, and spiritually there. What does that sound like? Spirit, soul, and body. We're a spirit, we have a soul, and we live in a body. you got to be there for your wife and your kids in those areas too. I think about it as a story of one summer night during a violent thunderstorm and this is for you mothers. A mother was putting her child to bed and there was a violent thunderstorm and he's scared. And there's a little boy and he says, Mom, Mama, will you just sleep with me in my bed because you know, I'm scared. And She says, I would honey, but you know I really have to go sleep in your father's bed, you know, because that's our bed and this is your bed. She says, I can't, dear. I have to sleep going. And after a long silence, the little boy was broken by what he heard. And then he just looks at his mom and says, he's a big sissy. I know we're men and we're solvers and all those things that we say, but there are times where we need to let our wives and our kids emotionally support us. And we have to be the, the father that knows when to do that. To be able to just say, you know what? Maybe I do need you to listen, and, or maybe I don't need you to listen, but I just need you to be here for that support. You have to work as a team. The fourth one, in verse 28 and 29, he says, So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. It's an unbreakable type of love. It's telling you to love your wife the way you love yourself. We can't break away from ourselves. And we shouldn't be breaking away from our kids. So you have to have that agape, unbreakable love that says no matter what we're going through, no matter how things are happening, I'm going to love you through it. Because I love you and I love God, which in turn shows the love I have for myself. It's not selfish. It's selfless and it's sacrificial. Romans 8.38 says, For I'm convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height, depth, or anything else in creation will be able to separate us from the love of Christ. And the last type of love that characteristic that we should have as fathers is a Christ-filled love. That's verse 30 through 32. Christ left his father to be with his bride, and that bride is called the church. We have to have a Christ-filled love to show our kids. I think about it this way. The father and, and Jesus were having a conversation, and it probably went something like this. The father said, Jesus, you know they're going to sin and die, don't you? Jesus answered, yes, Father. The Father said, they'll never be able to save themselves. It just can't be done. 
Jesus said, yeah, I know. And the father said, they'll need a savior. And Jesus looked back at his father and said, I'm ready. I'm ready. That's a Christ-filled love, and that is the gospel. And that's the gospel to us fathers, is that we have the best example of what a father is and how to feel his love, how to experience his love, and how to live in his love through his word, through his Holy Spirit, and through the people he's placed us with. So as we close, I just want to say this. I want to know the height, the breadth, the length, and the depth of the love who gave himself for us. I want to know the height, the breadth, the length and the depth of the love who gave himself for us. Well, God loves us. Our Father loves us. Oh, God loves us. Our Father loves us. Father, we thank you. We thank you. We thank you. We thank you for the gospel, the good news that you love us. I thank you, Lord, for each and every father that you comfort them, you guide them, you give them wisdom, you give them joy, you give them peace for those who have anxiety or are going through things during these hard times, that you just comfort them. And that us as fathers, we continue to seek your face and seek your will because we know with you we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. And Father, I thank you that you love us. I thank you for all that you've done. And Father, I ask that those fathers today who may be feeling inadequate or may be feeling like they've failed, that you encourage them to know that every day is new and your mercies are new, your forgiveness is there, and that they can continue to move on and be the men that you've called us to be. And for those who didn't have a father, I ask that you comfort them today, Lord, and that they know that they have the ultimate father, which is their heavenly father, or those who may have had a bad father, that they begin to forgive and they begin to see themselves the way you see them, not the way their earthly father saw them, if they were abusive or neglected them or did things. I thank you, Lord, that they begin to have healing when it comes to those things. And they know that you love us. And that the greatest example of love has already been shown by you giving your son, Father. And I thank you for that you comfort and guide us. Give us peace. Give us restoration. And for those who may not have spoken to their dad's father in years, I thank you that you begin to restore those relationships. For those fathers who haven't spoken to their children, I thank you for restoration, Father, that you just begin to heal those wounds. And it all starts with us coming to you, Father, because you're our Father and you love us. In Jesus' name, amen.